Okay, so then we find ourselves in section 12.3, which is called Velocity and Acceleration. Let's see, two C's, one L. Okay, so then now what we're do doing is we're going to continue to consider functions that have this form. R of t is, for example, in a three-dimensional case, f of t, g of t, h of t. So this is a vector-valued function. Uh, you can consider t to be time. Time is an example of a scalar parameter. And then if this was to be time, you could imagine this, R of t, is tracing out the path of a particle in time. You know, so for example, the uh, you know, the, the Earth is revolving about the, the Sun, okay, and then the Sun itself is revolving about something else, and they, in this revolution, they oscillate up and down a little bit, so the trajectory of the Earth is a, is a, is a path through space in time, okay, so, so this would be such an example. Uh, another example would be if you throw a ball in a perfect vacuum. <laughs> if you were to throw a ball in a perfect vacuum in a uniform gravity field, gravitational field, what uh, path would the ball take? A parabola, right? This is something that you learn from, from physics. We'll revisit this today. Uh, so what if, so something interesting about that is that, you know, if we are in, if we continue this hypothetical of being on a perfect vacuum with a uniform gravitational field and you throw a ball, then its entire trajectory will exist in a plane, right? It won't deviate from whatever, whatever initial velocity you give it, and its whole path could exist on one plane. So that's like a two-dimensional path within a three-dimensional space. So what if we ignore, if, what if we don't do this hypothetical, and I say, well, what if I throw a ball? and at right angles to the initial trajectory is some wind, right, then the ball is going to start curving in the direction of the wind, right, because it's going to receive a force from the wind. Okay, so then this, this uh, trajectory exists in a three-dimensional space because it's curving both to compensate for the gravitational force, the, the pull of, of gravity, and it's also curving to compensate for the force due to the wind, right? So it's sort of curving in two different directions. Okay, so does everybody kind of get the idea of these, these paths? I have to explain them like this a little bit uh, because I'm, you know, not a good <laughs> drawer because I'm a human being. Very few uh, humans are, are that excellent at doing it. Okay, so any question about what we're talking about conceptually? Any question about the concept? Okay, so here it is. I can summarize it with a picture. <coughs> so most of my drawings are going to be two-dimensional drawings, but you should understand that, the, that in fact these exist in multiple dimensions. Okay, <coughs> so for example, if I have a trajectory like so, some kind of trajectory, and this is the plot of R of t. Okay, then I can single out, I can single out a particular point on this graph, and if I ignore for a moment that this is the graph of a, of a vector-valued function and just look at it as just a graph, at that point, can you see that there is a tangency there? Yes, there is a tangency there. So then the calculus one tangency looks like so. Okay? <coughs> so that should that should come as no surprise to you. Okay, so then now now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a slightly different system here and say that okay, oh, not that. <coughs> and say the following. I'm going to <coughs> single out this point in time <coughs> as some time t. 
And then I'm going to move forward to another point in time. To another point in time, how about delta t? Uh, this one. I want this one. This one. This one. This one. <coughs> this one. This one. Okay, so then this one will be t plus delta t. Okay, so then now I have two points on the graph. I can draw the line which goes between the two points on the graph. Such a line is called a, a secant line, right? Such a line is called a secant line. So I could draw that secant line, which I'll depict in blue. Okay, so then the secant line is also not something that is new to you. But now we're going to start looking at something else, slightly different, and that is, okay, well, here's two points in space. Okay, so I can consider the directed line segment between them, right? And directed line segment is just a fancy name for what V word? Vector, right? So then what I'm going to, to do is I'm con going to consider this directed line segment that goes in between them, the vector, from here to here. Okay, so then now, this point right here, this is R evaluated at T, and what is this point right here? Right, R evaluated at T plus delta T. <coughs> R evaluated at T plus delta T. So does everybody, <coughs> everybody see? Okay, so then now, I can make a new vector. I can consider the vector. This vector right here is going to be mm, R of T plus delta T minus R of T. Right? That's what this particular vector is. <coughs> okay, so then now, as delta t becomes really small, the, the vector r of t plus delta t minus r of t becomes really small, so I'll normalize it by delta t so we don't lose, lose sight of it. And then now this is starting to look very much like what? The derivative, right? So in particular, I could say that, well, the derivative at t is equal to the limit of what? The limit at delta t goes to zero, good, of this expression. <coughs> so then, for every value of delta t, for every non-zero value of delta t, this expression inside of the parentheses is a vector. Right? Okay, for every value of, of <coughs> delta t. So then now, assuming this limit exists, Okay, because remember, we've already talked about limits of vectors and limits of other things. Limits don't have to exist. But if, if the limit exists, right, the limit of these vectors must also be a vector. Right? So then the, this vector right here inside of the limit is a vector which is parallel to the secant line, to, to a given secant line. So then this out here is also a vector, and it will not be parallel to a secant line. It will be parallel to the tangent line. Okay, so then this right here this right here is R of prime of T. Okay, so then that's interesting. So this picture <coughs> it's kind of getting a little bit busy now, so I'm gonna resketch another another version of it right here so that you can see what I'm trying to say. So this is R of t. At a particular point, you can consider the tangent line. That's what you would have done in calculus one. But now what we're going to consider is the tangent vector. OK, now, so here is, here is the tangent vector. So now, I have a question for you because I've made a choice and I haven't said why the choice was made yet. <coughs> okay, so if this is another copy of R of T 
and I choose the same point of attachment, then arguably, right, the, one of the requirements for the tangent vector is that it has to be a vector, right? <laughs> and it has to be parallel to the tangent line. So here is another vector which is parallel to the tangent line. So there is one piece of information that I haven't used on this graph which tells me that one of these is correct and one of them is not. Ah, the direction, right? The orientation of the graph. This graph, according to this arrow, is saying that you know, you're moving in this direction. Right? Moving in this direction. So then this, this, this one right here would be saying that uh, the tangent vector is pointing in the wrong direction. No, this is not the right one. Okay, so then this is the right one. So does everybody get the, the general idea? So then what we're doing today is we're going to talk about, okay, well, we've talked about this tangent line thingy. So now we're going to talk about tangent vectors, which is just like a discussion about tangent lines, except now the lines will have orientation. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. So then, that being the case... <coughs> So we have a remark about position, velocity, acceleration, and speed. Okay, so then, if the vector valued function r of t is, or how do you, let's say, what is the right way to say it, is, a twice differentiable function of time which so is a twice differentiable function of time t which gives the position So position of a particle, then several conclusions. So this particle is, you know, assuming that uh, r of t is not a constant function, then this particle is moving because its position is, is moving. And because it's twice differentiable, that means it's moving, in a sense, smoothly, right? It's not, uh, it's not teleporting. It's not suddenly changing its speed so that its derivative is discontinuous. It's twice differentiable. Then the velocity, <coughs> so first comment, is that velocity of the particle is denoted as V and is given by what? So how, uh, how are position and velocity related? Velocity is the derivative of position, exactly. So then velocity is the derivative of position, and that is to say that it is dr dt. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so you can probably imagine what's coming next. <laughs> Acceleration, right? The acceleration of the particle <coughs> is denoted. So then, if velocity is denoted with v, then acceleration is denoted with a. Okay. A. <coughs> And it is given by what? So then, how how is uh, velocity related to acceleration? Right, acceleration is the derivative of velocity, <coughs> which is to say, it is d v d t. Alternatively, you could say that it's exactly equivalent. Acceleration is the second derivative of position. 
which is the second derivative d squared r dt squared. Okay, so any questions about these things? Okay, so probably n neither one of these carries any surprise with it whatsoever. There is possibly a slight surprise here. Okay, the last word in here, right, we scroll up to the top there and it says velocity, acceleration, and speed. Okay, so then speed of the particle is given by, and I'll just note here that there is no particular notation, so no named notation. So like if it is typical in a problem where you're talking about particles to call the velocity v and the acceleration a. However, there is no particular notation for speed. Okay, great. So speed is of the two things that are on the page, velocity and acceleration, speed is more related to one of them than the other, I would argue. So it's more related to which one? <coughs> velocity. Okay, so then now, what is the difference between velocity and speed? One has a direction and one does not. Right? So then, <coughs> now, in particular, you need to be uh, sort of careful about that because right, the SIGN is considered part of the direction. Okay, so then speed is always a positive quantity. So then the speed is <coughs> the magnitude of the derivative of position, which is to say it is the magnitude of the velocity. <coughs> so I said it's always positive, but that's a, a misspeaking. It's always non-negative is the right thing to say. <coughs> Okay, so any question about just this jargon? So it's just jargon, right? Velocity, acceleration, speed, wonderful. So then, <coughs> just as, as an example to make sure everyone is clear, I could say that here's a particular position function, r of t is equal to, how about, t cubed uh, in the first coordinate, and how about t squared e to the t in the second? please compute the velocity, the acceleration, and the speed of this particle. <coughs> okay, so velocity denoted V. <coughs> Well, in the first coordinate, that will be 3t squared. In the second coordinate, 2t e to the t plus t squared e to the t, like so. So any question about that? So what happened in the second coordinate there? The product rule, good. Okay, so then the acceleration will be the derivative of the previous line, so then 6t. And then we will get 2e to the t plus 2t e to the t plus 2t e to the t plus t squared e to the t. I don't particularly care about any kind of simplification. Okay, so then the speed is the magnitude of the velocity. So then now, what does that mean to compute the magnitude of the velocity in this case? The square root of the sum of the squares, right? Good. Okay, so then it will be 3t squared squared plus 2t e to the t plus t squared e to the t squared. And, you know, I'll probably never ask this question, honestly. Something like this. But what will happen is you'll, you'll have to compute speed for one reason or another and, you know, it'll simplify into something nice because, you know, the square root thing is going to cause all kinds of problems. So now I'd like to point something out just as a matter of foreshadowing, <coughs> and that is this. What if, what if R of T is, uh, I'll just, I'll denote it like this without, 
parameter. I'll say that R is X and Y, where <coughs> X and Y are functions of T. Functions of T. Then, notice that DR dt, well, this will be dx dt in the first coordinate and dy dt in the second. So now, please tell me you compute the magnitude of dr dt. <coughs> and then when you see it, it should be visually striking to you and you should be recalling something. <coughs> okay, so then it will be the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So isn't doesn't that look familiar to something else you've seen before? Ah, it's, it's the same as the arc length. So then, now, it's not, we won't talk about it mm, today. We'll wait until just a little bit, you know, probably Thursday. But I'll just go ahead and say it now, and that is that the arc length of R of T over the interval A less than or equal to T less than or equal to B <coughs> is so first off the arc length differential is the is the magnitude of the derivative of r like so dt which is to say that ds is the magnitude of the velocity dt so that's what the arc length differential is. So then all arc length formulas have the following format. They are all <laughs> S is the integral from A to B of dS. Right? Every single arc length uh, formula takes this form. So then in this particular case it is the integral from A to B of the magnitude of dr dt dt. So then I'd like to point something out in this argument right here that I've made and I've highlighted in red. What dimension is that occurring in? Ah, well this part right here, this part right here that's starred now, that's two-dimensional. But this, this red part that I've written down, ah, that's any dimension. That's any dimension whatsoever. So then, I'd like to point out to you the strength of this notation, right? This notation it has a very significant strength in that it doesn't depend on the dimension that we're talking about. So this is a dimension-free representation. Okay, moreover, it is almost a coordinate-free representation. However, it does depend on the parameterization t, and we'll learn more about that later. Okay. <coughs> so any question about this? Okay, good. So now let's do an example. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to plot we're going to plot R of T is in the first coordinate T squared minus 1 I and then plus T J. So then I want you to plot this particular uh, function, this particular function, and I also, also want you to plot uh, V evaluated at several, several places. So how about 0 and 2? <coughs> OK. 
Okay, so as far as plotting is concerned, what, what do you think would be a good idea to check first? So this, you need to check, you need to remember back to your considerations of planar graphs because this is a planar graph. Incidentally, why is this a planar graph? It's two coordinates, right? Right, X and Y. It has to exist in the plane spanned by these two, I and J. It can't get out of that plane. Okay, so it exists in the plane. So then, you know, I made you a promise, more or less, about the planar graphs I would give you. What promise did I make you? That they would be almost always what? Starts with C. Conic section, right? They would almost always be a conic section. So probably this is a conic section. Yeah, let's check that. So then, if x is t squared minus 1 and y is t, then can you see somehow I can eliminate the parameter? Yeah, right? This is not very, doesn't require a lot of deep thought, so x is y squared minus 1. Okay, now that's a conic section, but unfortunately for you, you know, it's the one where you have to turn your head sideways to think about it, right? Because the variables are in the other positions than what you're used to. So then, this is what kind of thing? A parabola, right? This is a parabola. It opens how? To the right, good. And it has vertex what? Negative one, zero, right? No, is that right? Yeah, negative one, zero. Okay, so it's going to look sort of like this, just so we have something to think about in our mind's eye. And so is everybody seeing the direction this is going to go? Okay, now, <coughs> that's what the planar graph is going to look like. That's what its appearance is going to be, but specific the specifically, the planar graph is, is always going to be a subset of the corresponding rectangular graph. If you'll remember, because of various considerations, right, sometimes the rectangular graph gets cut and you only get a piece of it. So besides getting a subset of the rectangular graph, okay, what also does the planar graph have that the rectangular graph does not have? <coughs> An orientation, right? An orientation. So that is to say, right, we're not sure, you know, just looking at the rectangular graph, is the is the particle sort of doing this kind of business? Is it going like like that, or maybe it's doing something else? Maybe it's going in the other direction. You know, we can't tell just by looking at the rectangular graph. Okay, so then let's plot several points. <coughs> let's just plot the two points. Plot uh, the points t is zero and t is one. Okay, so when t is zero, what do we have? T is zero. When t is zero, R of t is what? Negative 1 <coughs> and 0. Okay, so then here's the point, negative 1, 0. Okay, at t is 1, R of t evaluates to what? 0, 1. So that's about right here. Okay, and then, you know, you could plot several more points, but you know it has to be a parabola, so it has to be looking like this. Okay, <coughs> so now I'm going to write. I'm going to write one more thing. It's going to. Currently, the graph is okay, but I'm going to write one more thing that makes it wrong. So then, here it is. So tell me what's wrong about it now. Ah, because this is an ambiguous orientation for the graph, right? Don't do that. Good. Okay. <coughs> so then, now, let's also plot 
Let's also plot the uh, velocity at those two positions. So then this is position t is 1. So the velocity, that is the derivative of position. So in the first coordinate, it will be what? 2t. And in the second coordinate, it will be 1. So then the velocity evaluated at t is 0 is what? 0, 1. Okay, so then now, let's plot the vector from <coughs> position at time 0. Let's plot velocity at time 0. So then, this vector 0, 1 is pointing how? Yes? Ah, it's still, you could draw another arrow. You could draw it like this, if you just really needed to have an arrow. <laughs> and maybe you could put another one right here. <coughs> okay. So then now, this, this vector v at 0 is 0, 1. So how is that with your hand? How is that uh, vector situated? Right. Up, like so. So it's about like this. Okay, so that's how the vector v evaluated at 0 appears. So now I'm going to draw another vector, and I want you to tell me why it couldn't possibly be correct. So now I want, to I want to evaluate the velocity vector at, at time is 1, this other blue point that I haven't drawn a vector to. So then now I'm going to do it like so. So like that. Could that be the velocity at 1? Okay, why couldn't it be? There's a very simple geometric argument why it could not possibly be it. It's not tangent, right? Look at, look at the graph. The tangent vector has to lie on the tangent line. If it doesn't, it's not a tangent vector. <coughs> okay, so then anytime, anytime we ask you to sketch the graph of a tangent vector, right, if, it, if it's way, way off of the tangent line, it's obvious that it's not even related to the tangent line, you're just going to get zero points for it. Okay, so then another one that could not possibly be correct is this one. Why could this not possibly be correct? It's going in the wrong direction, right? It's tangent. It's tangent, but it's not pointing in the right direction. Okay, good. So any question about these things? <coughs> okay, so then now, uh, for further entertainment, let's do the acceleration also. <coughs> Okay, so then how about the acceleration evaluated at any time t is equal to what? To zero. So I could ask in particular, how about the acceleration evaluated at zero? It's to zero. Okay, it's to zero there. In that case, how about the acceleration evaluated at one? Oh, it's still to zero, right? Good. Okay, so does everyone understand that the acceleration is constant? Okay, so someone give me an example of a physical situation where acceleration is constant or assumed to be constant. How about, yeah, something falling? This very room, right, that we're in, <laughs> gravity is assumed to be more or less constant so long as we're moving slow enough and staying close enough to the surface of the Earth. Yes? Sure, no problem. So, for example, uh, I could say that you know, I, I am the instructor. I'm going to say that time zero started when class started. So then when I was walking here, that was in the negative time domain. Right. Or we could say time is now, and that conversation we just had was in the negative time domain, whatever. Okay, so <coughs> now the vector A is, uh, look at that, I wrote one zero. <laughs> Two, okay, good. So then the acceleration vector is, is constant, right? Meaning no matter where you are on the graph, no matter where you are, it always looks like this. Right? So the acceleration is pointing to the right there. The acceleration is pointing to the right there. How about right here? Where is it pointing? To the right. Right. Good. Right? No matter where you are, it's always pointing to the right. So then now, now, if you can imagine for just a minute, 
take a look at this picture and imagine that you are maybe you have your head on a pillow right? you have your head on a pillow and you're you're lying in a field and you're watching people play baseball and gravity is pointing toward your you know your your right ear is toward the ground right so that the acceleration is pointing toward your right ear this is what the trajectory of a ball looks like right and the acceleration is the gravitational field right it's always pointing to toward the ground okay and it's constant okay so any question about this example <coughs> any question about it okay good So then now, <coughs> we have a remark. This is a remark about integration. So before the advent of GPS, right, GPS, I'm, by that I'm referring to the, the system of satellites that the US military and government put into the orbit so we can all tell exactly where we, uh, where we are, you know, that one, so you don't get lost. Okay, so before that, Right before that, if it w and it was if it was also cloudy, so that you couldn't use the stars to see where you are, because that was another thing that people used. Uh, you could use something else. Right? Does anyone know what another method of navigation is? Okay, but the, the okay. So if you can't see the sun and you can't see the star stars, but you can still see a compass. Okay, then what? Dead reckoning. This is the one I was looking for, right? Dead reckoning. Okay, this is also called inertial navigation. So that is, that is to say, right? Okay, so what if you're out in the middle of the ocean, right? And you're with Christopher Columbus, this guy who has some idea to go across the, the globe, okay? And it's cloudy. And you can tell that you've been, you've been traveling at, at a certain heading, at a certain speed for this long, right? So you're traveling, for example, 30 nautical miles for six hours. Well, how far did you go? Thirty nautical miles per hour, six hours, 180 nautical miles, right? So then, okay, <laughs> so y'all are <laughs> sleeping a little bit. Or maybe you're thinking about boats. I shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> okay, so, <coughs> so dead reckoning is, as you take your heading, the direction you are traveling, and also the speed at which you are traveling in that direction, and you do the following kind of idea. You say, all right, um, I'm traveling this far for that long, and then this far for that long, and then that far, and then that far, this kind of idea. So that maybe every hour, every hour you check your heading, right, because the direction of these vectors the direction of these little pieces tell you you're heading, like on a compass. <coughs> and then you can measure your speed and your time so you know how far you are. So then this was what was used to keep people from dying in the ocean a long time ago. Now we use GPS. Right? <laughs> Maybe it's an improvement. Okay, so then now, this procedure of doing this, dead reckoning, it's just a very rudimentary form of integration. That's all it is. So if you were to do the following kind of dead reckoning procedure, you could say that, well, it's not accurate enough for me to check my heading every hour, so I'll check my heading every minute. But maybe that's not accurate enough, so maybe I'll check my heading every second. But maybe that's not accurate enough, so then I'll check my heading continuously. Right? So then when you take the limit of how frequently you check your heading and measure your speed and all this kind of thing, you get an integration. So here it is. Okay, so, so this is all just a fancy way to say something that you probably could have guessed. That is position, R of T, can be recovered from V of T <coughs> and an initial position r of zero. Okay, that is to say that if you know where you are now, right, it does, dead reckoning doesn't help at all if you don't know where you start. <laughs> it 
if you know where you started and you know your velocity at every moment in time, then you know you can figure out exactly where you are. So what is the relationship? How are these things related, velocity and position? Ah, with the differential relationship, right? So then it is this. Okay, so then velocity <coughs> is dr dt, like so. So this tells you that dr <coughs> is v dt. So I want r, and I have dr. Let's compute an integral, right? <coughs> so then we can do this. R is equal to an integral from time 0 to time <coughs> whatever t of v dt, like so, <coughs> plus r evaluated at 0. So that is to say that this is where you started. And this was your inertial reckoning. Reckoning. Reckoning? Reckoning. Not a spelling major. Okay, and unfortunately I'm up here I don't <laughs> with the machine, but I'm writing with my hand, so I don't have a spell checker either. Okay, so let's do an example. <coughs> What I, what I mean to say is that if you have a known inertia, if you have a known velocity, and you know exactly, and your velocity is known at all times, then you can trace the path that you went on by an integration. <coughs> okay, good. So let's do an example. Where? <coughs> okay, so an object... starts at rest at the point p is equal to uh, 1 to 0. <coughs> and it moves with acceleration A of T is equal to <coughs> J plus 2K. Like so. Okay, <coughs> find the location after two seconds. <coughs> okay, so then the picture here is slightly more general, and I'm leaving it to you to see that this is exactly the same thing that we did on the previous page. There's some particle here at time, at time zero. Okay, so for all of the time before time zero, there was no force, no acceleration upon this particle whatsoever. And all of a sudden, without being asked, without being consulted, right, it starts accelerating. So then it starts accelerating... And then I want to know, where is it? Where is it after a certain amount of time? Okay, so then what you have is acceleration. So we are given acceleration A of T and initial velocity what? What is the initial velocity? Okay, I agree, zero. What is signifying to you that it is zero? It's at rest, right? Initial velocity, V evaluated at zero, is zero, zero, zero. It's at rest. Okay, so then how do you recover velocity from acceleration? With an integral. Okay, good. So then, <coughs> velocity well, that will be the integral 
the integral of 0 dt in the first coordinate, the integral of dt in the second coordinate, and the integral of 2 dt in the third coordinate. Okay, so then y, where did this come from? I pulled this out of thin air. Where, how did it come? Right, so that's from this, this piece right here, from, from this. <coughs> okay, so then I could say that this is equal to, in the first coordinate, some unknown value, uh, I'll call it V1, and then this will be T plus some unknown value V2 and then 2t plus some unknown value v3. Right, so then the v1, v2, v3 are the unknown constants of integration. So, but I can figure out what they are. What are they? Okay, they're 0. They're 0 because I can use the fact that 0, 0, 0 should be what I get when I plug in 0. So then that should be v1, uh, v1 v2, v3. So then I have fully recovered the velocity. The velocity is 0, t, 2t. Okay, so does everybody see how I arrived here? <coughs> okay, so now we have a velocity function and the instruction was to recover position. So how do you recover position from velocity? An integral. Okay, so then position position will be the integral of 0 dt the integral of t dt the integral of 2t dt <coughs> okay so then this will be what i'll say r1 that we don't know and then t squared over 2 plus r2 that we don't know, and then t squared plus r3 that we don't know. So that's r of t. So we know the position up to, up to these unknowns. So how do we determine the unknowns? Uh, use the initial position, right? So then specifically, this, this, can now use this because what it is is that r evaluated at 0 is p, right, which we said was 1, 2, 0. So then one two zero will be r1, r2, r3. So then we fully recovered the position. <coughs> which is what? 1 t squared over 2 plus 2 and t squared plus uh, well just t squared I guess <coughs> wonderful so any question about this example? it was boring I'm fully aware but any questions about it? yes? No, that's its position. This is its position vector. So then, pictorially, as a matter of a picture, this is what we did. We said, okay, well, I know that it started here at P, and I know what its velocity was at every moment in time. So then, now, I'm going to draw something that's more interesting than what the particle actually did, but... So then maybe the particle did something like this. Okay, so then that is its final position. This, <coughs> this right here, would be what? So then, what am, I, what am I doing here? This. This is its final position. Okay? So now we need to go on to something 
something else entirely. <laughs> okay, so this is section 12.4. <coughs> Section 12.4, not that one, which is called tangent vectors and normal vectors. Ah, you know what? We didn't answer the question, did we? Let <laughs> The last second, I forgot to answer the question. So what does it say? It doesn't find the location at any time. It says find the location when? At two seconds. So we have RFT. Okay, that was probably what she was saying, and I didn't understand. So we have RFT. We have RFT. How is it that we find out where the position is at two seconds? You plug in two, right? Good. OK. So this is the one that we wanted. We only wanted this one. It is what you get when you plug in two. OK. So then the final answer would be R of two is what? One and then four over two is two plus two is four, four. OK, that's better. <coughs> OK, so tangent vectors and normal vectors. OK. So then, let's say we have a curve. Okay. With this kind of orientation. So now, I'm going to make another copy of this graph. Okay, so then now, let's say that, you know, maybe if you were to look on Google Maps, you know, maybe this is part of your route to get to school or business or whatever you do. So some days you drive through this particular S-curve quickly, and sometimes you drive through it less quickly. But nevertheless, you stay on that path, right? Assuming you make no accidents, right? We'll assume an accident-free expedition. So then now, you travel this path, you can travel it quickly, you can travel it slowly, right? D at the beginning of the day, you travel it in the one direction. At the end of the day, you travel it in the other direction, right? So you can travel this path in a lot of different ways. So now let's assume we're talking about two different mornings that you're traveling this path to campus. Okay, one morning you're going fast and one morning you're going slow. Okay, so does everybody kind of understand the, the, what I'm saying? So... Oh, whoop, I don't want that. I want this. <coughs> so then I'm going to, con going to consider a point of attachment here, the same point. And one of them is going to represent, uh, so this will be two different R. So this is like R of T, and this is, say, Q of T. One of them will be the fast one, and one of them will be the slow one. So I'm going to draw two different ones, and I want you to tell me which one is the fast one and which one is the slow one. Okay, so what do you think? Yes, right? So yes, these are, these are uh, derivatives. These are tangent vectors. So which one is faster? Q, right? Or at least, more specifically, we can say at the point of attachment, it's faster. Right? OK, so then now, give me a geometric reason why. Ah, speed is the magnitude of velocity, right? So then in particular, the magnitude, this is the velocity vector, right? One of them is evidently longer than the other, so the speed of one is faster than the speed of the other. So then, there we go. However, you know, in a sense, in a sense, these curves are the same, right? They're the same curve. You're just traversing them at a different rate. So then, for this reason, uh, in order to to talk more specifically, to have be able to have a more precise analysis, we'll always talk about a specific tangent vector. Okay. 
a very specific tangent vector, which we'll say is this one. So then a vector which is parallel to both of them but has what length? What is the length that mathematicians always like to make their special vectors have? One, right? So then this right here, you know, on either graph, you're traveling fast, you're traveling slow. Okay, this is called the unit tangent vector. The unit tangent vector. And it is denoted as so. T, capital T with a hat of T. Capital T with a hat So then now, you know, R has this kind of hat, Q has this kind of hat, T has a pointy hat. Remind me again, what does the pointy hat mean? Unit vector, right? right the pointy hatness, right, gives it a, the unit vector, the length one, you denote such things with pointy hats. Okay, that's a common convention that you'll see in the physics classes that you're taking at the university. Okay. So, if that's the case, we need to have a formula for the unit vector. So, I've sort of described to you that a unit vector is a plausible thing to consider. If that's the case, we need to be able to compute one. So, what do you think? So, I could say the following. I could say, given, given R of t, the uh, tangent vector is mm, V, which is dr dt, right? That's the tangent vector. But for my previous example, I just showed you that, mm, generally speaking, tangent vectors don't have length 1. So if I give you a, a vector that doesn't necessarily have length 1, how do you produce from it a vector that has length 1? Divide by its length, right? So then the unit tangent vector is t hat, I'll write it without the parameterization, is, uh, you know, v over length of v. Or if you like it to write it the other way, like r prime over r prime length. Okay, now, the algebraic definition that we've written here brings to light something that wasn't discussed in the geometric consideration of it, right? The geometric consideration is that, well, I gave you two paths. I said one of them, we're going to traverse it uh, once fast and once slow, so it has two different uh, vectors. Uh, but mm, does the unit tangent vector always exist? Well, probably not, because I'm asking the question. So, when might the unit tangent vector not exist? Okay, when the derivative doesn't exist. Okay, that's a very important point, right? So then, now, if, if you're going through a sharp corner, right? <laughs> like, for example, you get t-boned in an intersection, right? Your derivative doesn't exist. That injures, that injures you, right? Where the derivatives don't exist. Okay, so then now let's assume that, uh, that the derivatives exist. When else might the unit tangent vector not exist? Have a look at the formula. Ah, when you're not traveling, right? If your speed is zero, then what direction are you going? Right? That's like a philosophical question, right? When I'm stopped at a stop sign, I'm going, me personally, I'm going all directions, right? No, maybe not. So then that's maybe too philosophical. Okay, so then, this is obviously not defined. Uh, when, when the velocity is zero, or you know, the magnitude of the velocity is zero. <coughs> okay. So, any questions about this? 
Okay, so then, <clears throat> so then now, here's something interesting. I could say, well, let's consider the following question. Find the equation of the tangent line to, uh, to R of t is equal to, how about t squared plus 1 and then 4t plus t cubed at t is equal to 2. Find the equation of the tangent line. And so let's make it more interesting. Let's make it more interesting. Let's make it a three-dimensional one. So then I'll say something else here like, uh, I don't know, what else have I used? We'll just say 5 plus t. Okay, so then this, I don't want you to fall back to your calculus one thought of lines. I want you to think of your calculus two thought of lines. Find the equation of a tangent line. Hmm. So this, in general, right, this will be some kind of line that's traveling through space, right, a line that is situated in three space somehow. Now, how many things do you need to define a line? Two things. What two things? A point on the line and the direction of the line. So you need two things. The a point that is on the line and the direction of the line. So then now, let's sort of just look at the geometry of what's happening here. I've given you some kind of R of t. Right, so R of t. At some point here, I said, you know, I just picked a point out of the air, and I said that, well, I'm going to consider this particular point R evaluated at 2. Okay, and I said, find the equation of the tangent line. So the tangent line, right, the tangent line, you know, is this thing right here. So what we really need, what we really need is a vector which is parallel to the tangent line. If only there was some way to find a vector that was parallel to a tangent line. The velocity, right? The velocity is parallel to the tangent line. The derivative, the tangent vector is parallel to the tangent line. Okay, so then this right here, this vector, that's the vector that we want. Right, so I'll say that that is m is equal to the velocity evaluated at 2. And this is the point that we want. <coughs> p. Or no, I called it b when we first were talking about lines. b is equal to r evaluated at 2. So then now, just having a quick look at a sketch, this should be a pretty straightforward problem. b is what you get when you plug in 2. So what do you get? You get uh, 5 and then ooh, 8 plus 8 is 16, and then 7. Okay, good. And then now I'll need, <coughs> I'll need the velocity. So the velocity function is 2t, and then 4 plus 3t squared, and then 1. Okay, so then the velocity, m, so evaluated at 2 will be what in the first coordinate? 4, and in the second coordinate, 16, and in the second coordinate, 1. <coughs> okay. I'm just, let me know if I make a mistake. I'm not so excellent at arithmetic. Okay, so then the answer is that the line is, you could say Q of T is MT plus B. But really, let's not use T because T is already being used, so let's use a different name. Q of S is MS plus B. Okay, so then you could say that this is equal to 4, 16, 1, S plus 5, 16, 7. <coughs> okay. So any question about this? So incidentally, if I recall correctly, when I was making lines back in the day, right, I was always calling them R. Why didn't I call this one R? 
because we already have an R, right? <laughs> we already have an R. And why didn't I use the parameter T? Because we're already using parameter T, right? So then you need to be careful about these name collision things, okay? So any question about this example? So any question? Okay, good. So now let's continue. <coughs> So we have another remark. I draw again this function. Okay, and I choose again point on it. And now I will draw the unit normal vector. Except I'm going to draw it long so that it's easier for me to draw other things. So then this is the unit, uh, excuse me, the unit tangent vector. Okay, so then now, <coughs> in the plane, there is a line which goes through this point and is orthogonal to that vector, right? It is this line. Right? Okay, the situation in space is more complicated because you know, if I consider this tangent vector on the plane, the set of points which go through this base point and are orthogonal to that is a line. How about, how about what is the set of points that are orthogonal to a given vector in space? It's not a line. It's a what? A plane. I, a plane. So, for example, here I am standing normal to the plane of the floor. And I'm standing normal to the plane of the floor. I'm holding my arm normal to the plane of the wall. Right, so then, so then normal to a vector in space is a plane. Normal to a vector in the plane is a line. Good. Okay, so then now, I want to choose a vector. I'm going to have some properties. So I'm going to describe to you a vector. And it has to have the following properties. One, I want to have it to have unit length. Okay. I want it to be orthogonal to the unit tangent. Okay, so currently there are two possibilities. What possibilities are there? So I'll draw the two possibilities. So then, if they're going to have unit length, here's one of them. Assuming that you know I've, I've eyed the length correctly. That's one of them. Where's the other one? In the opposite direction. All right, so then the, res the requirements that I've written down, not enough to be specific yet. Right? Can you see that there's two possibilities? OK. So then. The one that's left is the one that I want. So someone describe, describe to me how it is that I specify this one. So sorry? Direction. Yeah, I want, so I want to say it's, it's this one and not the one pointing in the exact opposite direction. So does someone try and describe to me what it, what vec how do I describe this? Sorry? Okay, okay. Something a little less technical than that. <coughs> Anyone? Sorry? Okay, so let's think of it like this. What if we were traveling, what if we were traveling on this curve in the orientation indicated, right? At the point, would you be turning right or left? You'd be turning to the right, right? So then how, so then, it will be in the direction of your turning. So then how about, what if we were traveling on the path, on this path, in the opposite direction? It would, you would be turning left. Uh, but it's still always pointing in the direction you're turning. Okay, so then the requirement, the third requirement is, is that it needs to point in the direction 
of curvature. Okay, so then this one right here that we have just specified is this. It's denoted as n, and it is called the unit normal vector. Okay, so then now, just to make sure that everyone is clear, please uh, draw the unit tangent and unit normal at this point. <coughs> okay, so then the unit tangent has to be parallel to the tangent uh, line. It has to have length 1, and it has to have orientation which is compatible with the orientation of the curve. So these three tell you that it has to be pointing like so. Okay, so that's the unit tangent. Okay, so then how about the unit normal? Is it, is it still pointing on this side of the curve? No, it's pointing on the other side because it has to point toward curvature. Yes, you have a question? That's a good question. We're going to get to that in just a second. Right, so then notice, right, the same requirement is the same exact thing as the unit tangent, right? So then the tangent, you, we say it has to be pointing in the direction of motion. What if there's no motion? Ah, then there's no unit tangent. Okay, similarly, we just said it has to point in the direction of curvature. What if there's no curvature? Ah, then there is no unit normal. Okay, and we'll see that in just a second. <coughs> Okay, so then now, <coughs> let's consider here for a minute, uh, just to remind you of some things. The expression T cross N. So what if actually this is existing in a three-dimensional space? Tell me about T cross N. Where is it situated with respect to the graph? It's either, it, has to be, it has to be orthogonal to T and also orthogonal to N, first off. Right? It has to be orthogonal to both of them, which means it is either going into the page or going out of the page. Okay, so then now, how do you tell? With the right-hand rule, right? You put your hand on T. So, for example, on this one, you put your hand on T okay, and make it to where you can turn toward N. T cross N is coming out the direction of your thumb, right? So then if you, if you were to put your thumb in, right, your hand doesn't, doesn't do that. Right? Maybe. <laughs> so then <coughs> this one, this one right here is going into, uh, no, out of the page. Okay, how about the other one? This one's going, this first one is going into the page or out of the page? Into the page. Okay. So now, we're not going to go into it in this class, but now, right, in three space, now we have three vectors. I can talk about three vectors, right? I said the unit tangent has to be the vector that's parallel to the tangent line length one and compatible with the orientation of the curve at that point. Then I can say the unit normal has to have a specific property, which I, I haven't gone into enough yet. And then I can say if I have the unit tangent and the unit normal, then I can cross them and find a vector that's orthogonal to both of those and then make sure it has length one. Okay, so then now you have a right-handed system and you can do all kinds of very neat calculus there, but we're not going to do it. See you on Thursday. <coughs>